Dear friends, thank you for supporting this channel on Patreon to join our growing family of donors, now 59 patrons strong. And remember, once we reach 100 active patrons, we will start sending out a one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle, autographed by your host, Donegan Kaiser, to one active supporter each and every month. Thanks for taking a minute to pitch in by going to patreon.com slash reluctantpeppers and pledging your support today. Thanks very much. Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're always glad to have this returning guest. David Morgan is the founder and host of The Morgan Report and TheMorganReport.com. He's here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. David, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me back. I guess you're not tired of me yet. Maybe I can wear you out. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're recording this on Tuesday, May 22nd, 2018. For those, of, those in our audience who are very keen on knowing the date, there it is. And uh, no, we're never tired of hearing uh, your expert uh, wisdom and experience and perspective on the markets. We have to remind everybody that the discussions we're having here are not to be construed as individual financial advice. They are for educational purposes only and everyone needs to do their own due diligence, but we're always grateful for your perspectives. And recently both you and uh, like Mike Maloney of Gold Silver and others have been talking about an emerging the almost two years in the making uh, technical uh, formation on the silver market. We'd like to get to that and see if we're coming to a crisis point soon. But before that, if we could zoom out and look at the macro picture of geopolitical tensions and developments that may sometimes become market moving. We've seen in the last week or so, uh, well, or even over the last few uh, weeks and months, uh, very ups and downs in relationships between the United States and uh, North Korea, South Korea, uh, tensions in the Middle East, that sort of thing. We've had, um, our, we have a family member who lives in the Middle East and had to actually evacuate uh, for a, for a weekend there because of tensions about bombings that was going to be happening, that sort of thing. Um, so, if we could get your perspective on how material do you believe these global geopolitical factors are in moving uh, precious metals markets, and how and much attention do you believe that our people who are concerned about protecting themselves from undue financial risk need to pay to those geopolitical events on a daily or weekly basis? Well, that is really a great question, and there is not a really good answer, and I'll answer it this way. If you go back to the bull market in 1980, the peak January 21st, 1980, the last thing of I mean, a series of things that kept pushing gold higher was the uh, invasion of Afghanistan. So in that context, you say, oh my goodness, any war effort or anything that looked like an increase in tensions would send a metals price higher. And in that context, it's true. However, once we started the bear market, that was from basically that time frame, a couple good bounces for 20 years until we started the new bull market around the year 2000, <clears throat> almost any political tension had nothing whatsoever to do with moving the market. And that's kind of where we are now. So. You know, a lot of this buying the rumor, selling the news, which is an old adage, is somewhat true, but you got to know if you're in a major bull market or not. So I would answer it this way. In the context of where are we in the market, which is still, I would say, a neutral to slightly positive market, it will have some effect, but not probably as much as it would in a full-blown bull market. That, I think, is the safest answer. I'll add on to that. <clears throat> What interests me is what I've commented on my weekly perspective that I try to keep to about 10 or 15 minutes. The only places that seem to be causing so many problems are North Korea, Iran, and Syria. And if you look at where the bankers are not in charge, it's North Korea and Iran. 
So, you know, you, from my perspective, you ask me my opinion, it's very interesting that where the geopolitical tensions remain to be the most newsworthy, because a lot of stuff goes unreported, they get a great deal of news out of these factions that basically aren't under the the conglomerated global banking system. They're resistive to it. So I think that's something to note. And beyond the geopolitical developments, if we could look at the larger picture of financial markets in, in general, uh, outside of the uh, precious metals markets, which is our primary topic that we usually discuss with you, um, what do you see happening on the, in the broader picture of bonds, stocks, both uh, domestically and internationally, that people need to be aware of or are keeping an eye on big trends that you're seeing unfolding this year? Well, I would have to defer back to probably one of the best uh, teachers I had. It was indirect, not direct, but looking at his work, and that's the late John Exter. And he had the Exter Pyramid, which has been added on to by Trace Mayer on his website, Run to Gold. And what it is, is is a, a picture, a drawing of an upside-down pyramid showing the liquidity squeeze. And what it has at the top is now derivatives, and what it has at the bottom is gold. And some of us have put silver at the very tip. And if you go from the most liquid to the least liquid, you go from the top of the pyramid to the bottom. And remember, it's inverse. In other words, it's pointing down. So you go from something that's been trusted for thousands of years and a liquidity squeeze is the most trusted, most known, and most sought after, and that's gold and silver. That's at the apex. And then just up from that is the United States dollar, the dollar bill, the physical currency, that fiat that I make so much fun of that everyone uh, that's aware knows it's not backed by anything. But nonetheless, that is the next most important go-to physical asset you can own. And that's easily proven not only by my book, The Silver Manifesto, but just by the historical records. Don't believe me, do a bit of research. It'll take you about 20, 30 minutes. But almost in every case, and I'll use my book again, The Silver Manifesto, I think we cited something like 30-something countries that failed their currency since like 1990. That's not that long ago. And all and every one of them defaulted, but they didn't go out of business, so to speak, because they replaced their currency with a United States dollar. Wow. So dollar bills and $10 bills and $5 U.S. Federal Reserve notes specifically are the go-to de facto fallback position for almost all these countries whose, whose system fails, or currency fails, I should say. So that's next up the pyramid. Then you go into short-term treasuries, then you go into all government bonds, and then you go into corporates, and on up you go on the pyramid. So what it shows is the instability of the system. And that is why I want to answer this question. I know I gave some background, but you know, how I think and, you know, my, my degrees and all that. And I want to make a big deal about being educated, believe me. <clears throat> but the point is that before we see the massive run to gold, we will see a big run of the dollar. So there's been some talk lately uh, amongst, um, you know, some of the gold aficionados. And, you know, gold bugs are a peculiar case. Uh, you know, I mean, for me, I've always tried to maintain balance. I've always tried to maintain the fact that 20% in the sector is probably enough. Any more than that, it's up to you. But uh, you don't, you're not required to own nothing but precious metals to uh, have a satisfactory financial life. In fact, I, I think you can overweight. But regardless, I'm not going to make anyone's decision for them. So you will see a run to the, to the dollar. But what's not really noted of late is you could have the dollar – uh, moving up against all other currencies, simultaneously it's failing. So let me explain that. I'm not trying to talk over anyone's head, and probably most people caught what I said. But you could have a dollar doing better against the yen and the euro and the Kando and the Aussie dollar and whatever. Just killing it. Everyone wants a U.S. dollar. But at the same time, that dollar is buying less and less and less and less. So it could go a scenario somewhat like, uh, I'm just going to use oil as a factor, but let's just assume as oil prices go up, almost everything else follows along with it. Let's just make that thought experiment. You don't have to agree with that premise, but let's just do it because I want to. I don't want to have to explain every little detail. So from a macro perspective, the dollar's killing it. It's moving up against every other foreign currency that exists. Just moving. 
But at the same time, oil or gasoline prices go from $4 a gallon to $5 a gallon to $7 a gallon. Some point in that range, you're going to get people that are really having to struggle because they can't afford to go to work or they got a flip decision. You know, do I hire the babysitter or don't I? And, and a lot of things fall the price of oil. So you could have a, a strong dollar relative to other currencies and a weaker dollar relative to something of value like what it what you can buy with it. So this wasn't addressed in a recent uh, situation in one of my uh, paid subscribers. All my paid subscribers are allowed to ask me two questions a month. Uh, this gentleman happened to reach out to me on a Sunday, and I was far from bored. In fact, I was somewhat exhausted. But such a uh, thought-provoking question, I answered it to him on Sunday, and he was really <laughs> taken back that I would do something like that. But you know, I and it's not a one-man show. I have two analysts, and a lot of times, some of these questions, especially on the stock side, I'll defer to one of the analysts. But <clears throat> Regardless, that is the long but very important answer. So there'll be some point in there where the dollar's good and people are glad to have dollars. And, you know, some of the U.S. citizen types will be saying, wow, I'm glad I've got cash in the bank or wow, I'm glad I have cash. Look at what this is doing. I could go to Canada. And that will be an interim period. And that will last for X amount of time and probably not a real long time. It won't be a week. It won't be a month. But it'll be a few months probably. And then slowly you'll see this start to lose purchasing power within the context of the United States and elsewhere, really. And that's where we'll go from wanting to have dollars to wanting to shun them and move into the into the precious metals. As, uh, you know, as Martin Armstrong has said, I mean, gold is like the anti-government uh, hedge. And I agree. Um, it's, it's other things. It's a crisis hedge, I think, from a broader perspective. But the final domino to fall, it's when, you know, I, I forget who says it. I, you know, it's Jim Rickards. And I can't quote him exactly, but, you know, in one of the earlier bailouts, you know, bank bailed it out. And then when, you know, Wall Street started to fail, the, you know, basically the Fed bailed it out. Now when the country fails, who bails them out? And the answer is nobody, really. So that's the point we're at. These crises get bigger and bigger and bigger. People said, well, you've been crying wolf forever. And I'm saying probably not forever. I'm not that old. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we did fail. We actually did fail in 2008, and I'll make that argument. I'm not going to make it here. I've made it too many other times, and it's too uh, laborious to go into. But we really have never come out of it. And so all we've really done is delayed the maximum failure. I mean, the, the, the maximum failure means where there's a reset that's so harsh, so pervasive, so ubiquitous, so absolutely all-encompassing to every person that has anything that's ever touched a piece of currency in their life that they know something has happened. In 2008, only really the financial stalwarts really knew what was happening behind the scenes because from the public perspective, somebody came to the rescue. I am suggesting this next time that perhaps there won't be anyone to come to the rescue, although they'll probably try. The cavalry will ride up and they'll be looking over the cliff and it's too late to save anything. That's a metaphor. What you were talking about a moment ago about the U.S. dollar appearing to be stronger than any of the foreign currencies and yet... You know, weakening against uh, real tangible assets sounds like what we've heard referred to as the race to the bottom in devaluations of fiat currencies. If you picture uh, like fish in a fish tank, they're all swimming down to the bottom. Just because the, the U.S. dollar happens to be the slowest one swimming to the bottom, doesn't it, it can be relatively stronger than, than the, the crowd of other losers, but it's still a loser uh, against real things that, you know, ranch land or petroleum or precious metals or food or energy or whatever. Um, if we could uh, next turn our attention to, and you talked about this a little bit, you brushed up against it, about the real economy. Uh, what is actually, in your view, uh, happening and has been happening for the past decade in terms of real wealth creation, real employment, uh, real um, uh, creation of uh, GDP, both in the U.S. and abroad? Are we seeing, uh, are we keeping it up? Are we getting, are we ahead? Uh, the, you know, the Fed always says there's like a 2% target uh, inflation rate. And are we, are we actually growing in real terms like greater than that? Or as we recently we, had Rob Kirby on talked about being in a terminal beginning. contraction or terminal uh, decline phase. Um, what's your view on the reality of the economy, both domestically and globally? Well, I'm going to use it. I'm going to speak domestically, but it, uh, well, I can do both, of course. 
So domestically first. So if you look at, first of all, let me defer to uh, John Williams, my friend from shadowstats.com, who does an excellent job. And I would say that um, from the crisis of 2008, well, really before that, from 1977 to present day, real purchasing power for the average wager in the United States has gone down. So that's a fact. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. You can look it up. Now, the physical economy is what we, you know, can look out our windows or driving through a major city or an airport or whatever, look out and see, you know, especially, let's say, a large road trip across the country. I mean, you got a pretty good feel for the physical economy if you drive a car from, say, California to New York. And I'm just using that again as an analogy. But what you'll see is, you know, you'll see wealth, you'll see like cornfields and you'll see soybeans and you'll see all this stuff growing and you'll see factories and you'll see apartments and you'll see you know, airports and all this stuff. But the basis truth is, yes, the, global, the U.S. domestic economy has basically been contracted. Now, if you look at retail stores and the amount of retail stores that have closed, or for example, some of the retail stores that have closed a great portion of them, and of course they blame it all on Amazon. They but do, just, yeah. It's, it's just not true. What it is, is it's a contraction as Rob Kirby states and then if you look at the games they play, meaning channel stuffing, which I picked up from Dave from uh, X22 report. I didn't, never knew the term channel stuffing until sure. I heard it from him. But this is true in my area, and I you know, travel a great deal, and I see it everywhere I've been. And well, channel stuffing is where the, um, the manufacturers of automobiles, Ford, GM, uh, or whomever, uh, produces a car, and once it leaves their factory, it's counted as a sale. So on the books of GDP, it looks wonderful. Look at the auto sector. At least it's strong. But they're not selling these things. What they're doing is they're sticking them on auto dealerships, and they're running out of space. There's a new auto dealership here, new meaning. I think it was about three years ago they put this one brand new from the dirt up. And it was uh, what they call small to medium size for the town that I'm in. And now you cannot, you can't get a bicycle. Yeah. On <laughs> I mean, there's every single space that was made pavement has a vehicle in it. But on the sides, they're parking in the dirt. They're parking behind yeah. the building. Yeah. I mean, they are stuffing these things. And I like channel, you know, channel stuffing is a great. Right. Oh, right. Yeah, you're, you're that, stuffing no, your term. distribution channel. And this is not just here. You go up to the next town up, which is called Deer Park. When I moved here almost 20 years ago, I was going to buy, a, I decided to buy a new truck. I was going to buy a used truck and save the money. And the difference in price wasn't that great. It was actually smarter for me as far as I determined to buy a new truck, and I did. But the point I make is I drive up to this next town, and it was like, again, a mid, it was the only dealership in that town. And they had new and used. And they had like their trucks out in front that, uh, oh gosh, at the, and you, you know, so I'm just going to stab at a number. The, the numbers aren't really important. What's important is the idea. So there was probably 20 trucks out there. Now there's probably 200 trucks, RVs. I mean, this thing is, is it's a big because it, land is cheaper there. And it's basically like on a pasture. There is pavement and everything. I mean, I'm not that big a hick. But the point is that there's a lot of surrounding just pasture. And it's just covered with unsold cars, both new and used. And this isn't just two examples. I see this all over the country. So I made a big deal out of really a big deal. I mean, there's an adage that used to say, as General Motors goes, so goes the country. There's one to say, California goes, so goes the country. The point is... On paper, we might look like we're growing, and some sectors are, but basically, it's all the high corporate, highly protected, highly subsidized, government control, um, socialistic type of uh, environment on an economic uh, basis where everyone's equal except we'll subsidize you and you and you and you and you, but you people don't get subsidized. And this is true in the agricultural market where we've got nothing but packaged foods that poison us. And it's very hard to find organic. And even when it says organic, you aren't absolutely 100 percent sure all the time. So that's the food industry. It's distorted and it's a joke. It's really harming us rather than helping us. It's true in the auto industry, as I just explained. It's true 
in education where we go to the lowest common denominator rather than make everyone strive to be their absolute best. We're at good and, oh, that's good enough. You can put an X on a paper and you pass the writing class. I mean, everything has been degraded to the point that it's absolutely, positively showing us that we are failing. And does that mean collapsing? Yeah, I could substitute the word, but we failed morally, we failed politically, and we failed monetarily. And there isn't much left to fail. Now, you'll say, well, David, I still got a great job and I still blah, 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 blah. And that's fine. And I'm, I'm happy for that. But unless you get really right with yourself and get really true with the picture that's really going on that me and many others have outlined and really take a look, take the glasses off as a metaphor and just take a hard look and see for the first time maybe that things are much, much different than what we are brainwashed and programmed through the mainstream media, the mainstream uh, radio shows of the propaganda press, which is the Mockingbird Press. Propaganda is rampant. There's hardly anything in the truth um, you know, situation from the mainstream. And even in the truth uh, movement, uh, there's, there's certain areas that certain channels won't even address. And so on and on it goes. And the point is that, yes, we are failing and we're starting to fail faster. And I digress once more, Dunnigan, but one of the books I keep referring to, I do this about every third interview, was Collapse of Complex Societies. And the main point from that book is no matter what starts, what's the trigger point, the tipping point, once you start down, you can't come back up. I think we started down in 2008. I think it's just been a slow roll because there's so much faith in the system that it's been able to maintain some semblance of uh, being okay, but okay at best. And yes, I, I don't want to, you know, get into the minute ideas of the fact that there are certain sectors that have done well and have grown and are new and are innovative and are probably helpful to humanity since then. It's not all gloom, but on balance. So now, globally, the China boom is, is pausing China boom is really what kept the uh, fiat system going for so long. I mean, one of my main uh, oversights was that, uh, you know, I thought we'd kind of run the course. And then, of course, it didn't. It kept going. And the reason was, if you've got a Ponzi scheme, the only way to keep the Ponzi going is to get a hell of a lot more people That's at the right. bottom That's of the right. pyramid. That's right. That's right. So we added the Keynesian economic model to the Chinese and had them buy in full, you know, hat ass and spats, as they say. They went full in. To the Keynesian model to let's borrow borrow ourselves rich, so they bought into the whole thing. So that kept the whole game going for at least another decade, and, and it boomed the global economy. And they talk about talk industry. about channel <laughs> stuffing. <laughs> yeah, talk about channel stuffing, building cities with nobody in them. Exactly. So here we are. So on the global perspective, you could take my analysis of the U.S. economy from a real perspective, not a GDP paper printing, you know, insurance company portfolio of assets, stock market, bond market perspective, but a real look out your window perspective and apply that to China as well. Yeah, I thought you were actually getting much more physical right at the beginning when you said uh, uh, you could get a feel for the real economy of our country by driving across it. I thought you were going to talk about the bumpy roads that people were going to feel from the neglected infrastructure. Everything, you know, it really is. It's a sad state of affairs and it's a, you know, Rome is a good metaphor for what's going on. I mean, you know, you just, um, it, it's, it's, you know, the, I forget who said it, I give him credit, but you know, how did you, I think it was Jesse Livermore, maybe not, I don't know. Anyway, it was somebody, you know, how did you go broke? And he goes very slowly, and then all of a sudden, and that's again an analogy for things are deteriorating, 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 but you know, I'll take this road, I know that one's going to, you know, there are too many potholes, and there's ways around, and people adapt pretty easily, and they find ways to, you know, other ways of doing things, and on and on. But it's right in front of your face, folks. It's really there if you just open your eyes. You know, and, you, you, you really got me when you said all you have to do is take a road trip and you'll see these overstuffed dealerships because we just came back from a five-state driving trip and I had noticed exactly what you were describing. Every one of the car dealerships we passed had these massive lots just stuffed with trucks and cars. And I, and I said to my wife at a couple of times, I said, how can they afford? Look at that. Look at all that money just sitting there. And 
I, it, then it echoed back in my head what uh, you know Gregory Manorino from TradersChoice.net and Rob Kirby and others have said, and you have said on our channel, and that is, what happens when you get into a zero interest rate and negative interest rate uh, policy and regime for a long enough period of time is you get huge distortions and misallocations of capital. And when you talked about the uh, over the channel stuffing, uh, stuffing your sales channel, calling it a calling it a sale. Uh, calling it uh, GDP, uh, and then you talked about China, and I thought, okay, that that totally makes sense because they have been, you know, building, uh, you know, more more concrete, more steel, more solar, more everything than the entire world can consume for some time. And then just now, when you talked about little by little, and then suddenly and all at once, I thought if we could now turn to the technical analysis portion of our discussion about the silver markets. We've been seeing movement in the silver prices. Um, most people who've been paying attention for some time are still stinging for, perhaps from uh, a major setback over the past, say, six years in, in the uh, silver and gold price markets. Although, uh, as our recent guest, uh, Frank Holmes, pointed out, uh, <laughs> that the precious metals are up like almost double or at least 50% more than the S&P for, for this uh, century, that is, so far for the last 18 years. But specifically that we've seen this uh, little by little uh, 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 decay of uh, compression of the, the movement in the, in the price market that seems to be heading towards a, a point of uh, will it be little by little and suddenly all at once. And if you could talk us through what you've been watching these silver markets for a long time, longer than most of us, what do you see when you look at the silver market as far as this trend developing and where you think it may be taking us next? So you've got this wedge like this. And uh, oops. And just to give people an understanding of the time frame you're looking over there, this is not a daily yeah. or weekly uh, no. view. No, that's um, uh, that's from 2016, so it's two years. So I've been forming this back and forth, and then you know I've made the point that the bottom is in in my uh, estimation, and it is. And I don't know how to do this really well. I don't do this real time, but you know you look at the uh, bottom there, and then a higher and a higher and a higher basically it's that uh, it's we're moving up so that that low excuse me you got higher low so that's the low i said that's the bottom mm -hmm. then you got a higher low and maybe about equal maybe slightly lower higher low and a equal low gold it's more obvious you got a higher low a higher low and a higher low so you're definitely an uptrend in gold silver is always a little more tricky so you got this wedge. So this is basically where you get a breakout pattern. And right now you see these squiggles in here and we are seeing this really um, consolidate. You know, as Mike talked about, Mike Maloney, it's a, a coil and you can see it's kind of like a spring coil. So normally in trading, you wouldn't, you'd be objective. You wouldn't say it's going up or down. You would wait for a break to occur. And once it occurred, you would say, if it goes to the downside, you go short and went to the upside, you go long. It's that simple. Of course, I'm biased. I think it's more likely to break to the upside, but the market knows more than any of us. But certainly this kind of pattern can't go on forever because you run out of time. And we are. So um, if you look at the commitment of traders, what you'll find is that it's very advantageous to the, um, to the uh, silver market. Um, this is the latest commitment of traders. And what you'll see here is we're still got a huge open interest, almost 200,000 open. But if you go over to the commercials, they're short 96,000 and long uh, 78,000. So you do the math there, that's 18,000 net short, which is much higher than they've been. And then what you have on the non commercials is you got a, almost a zero sum game here. You've got 72,000 long positions and 72,000 short positions. So very unusual for them. So they're basically neutral. And <clears throat> so it's it's fairly positive um, with at this setup right now. Uh, it's very curious to me that the open interest has been so high, but there's a lot more involvement in futures markets than there are. There's less, it's interesting that there's less interest in the physical markets. And that's true, I've talked to every dealer, including some of now in major retailers, but wholesalers and actually depositories. And, you know, the, uh, the amount of people that buy silver coins, for example, and gold has fallen off. Yet, if you look at the derivatives markets, um, like futures and options and ETFs, they're actually pretty robust. So basically, most of the money 
I'll put money in quotes, in the metals markets is through uh, the paper markets, through the exchanges, through the derivatives, not in the physical. Help which people, is can you help people understand what open interest stands for? What does that mean? That means uh, what the amount of contracts that have not been settled yet is. So for every contract, there's a long and a short. And that means there's uh, almost 200,000 bets out there that, and of course, entities have multiple contracts. I mean, some people trade, the individuals trade in one, two, five, 10, 20, 50 contracts. Uh, firms like trading funds trade in probably 100, 200, 300, 400 contract type of thing, thousands and thousands, 2,000. And large banks trade in the thousands of contracts. So it isn't that there's 200,000 separate uh, you know, entities out there. There's really not you know, that many Con, there's that many contracts they're held by, let's say, a uh, rather small portion of, of entities. So that is just the open amount that haven't been closed. So let's say silver goes up 50 cents. Then most likely you would see a decrease in the open interest because the people that were short will cover, meaning they'll have to buy back and in that case probably lose money to get out of the contract, which will bring the open interest down because that contract is now closed out. It's and, like volume. It's like volume in a Sure. Stock. Okay. And you were saying that in general, the fact that you're seeing um, more commercials uh, short uh, than long uh, indicates to you a a bullish setup. Is that because? Well, not really. I mean, when there's more, I, I kind of misstated that. I mean, when there's more short than long the commercials almost always win because those are your banks they call them commercials if we were talking about soybeans commercial interest would be really the adms of the world that grow soybeans and they would have contracts with the exchange and they would actually protect their soybean positions that's the idea it's more of a speculative casino now in all commodities but especially in the metals and especially in silver but in silver, it's not your Pan American silvers and your whatevers. I mean, some of the larger conglomerates, such as uh, your RTZs and BHPs, your huge conglomerate base metal miners that mine a huge amount of silver, uh, do have their commercial interest handled by bullion banking uh, firms that will basically play the futures market for them. So anyway, the point is that the commercials hardly ever lose. And since they are net short 18,000 contracts, that's actually bearish because they hardly ever lose. It's not as a awesome a setup as it was a few a month ago or so. I think Mike and I did an update uh, when I was in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And that week and about two or three weeks prior to that, I have to look back. My time moves fast at my age. But it's been about three weeks before that. So I'd say in the last month or so, things have started to look less um, bullish as than they were at that point in time. But these things are a little bit tricky. Uh, they're not really that good at timing. They're pretty good at positioning. In other words, you kind of know when to enter and when to get out of the market if you're so inclined. But they don't give you like a day or even a week. I've watched these things where it was very bullish and nothing happened for quite a while, then all of a sudden it took off or be very bearish and immediately react. Uh, in 2016, I saw the open interest was the highest I'd ever seen in my life. And um, I said, that's it. I don't think there's m much left to sell. I'm going to exit my position. And that was exactly right on that year. We had a good year in 2016. I was starting to pick up. A lot of my expireds came back to uh, you know, to the paid subscription service and everybody did really well. Plus we use the equities, which, you know, I know is people that are metal only heads and that's fine. That's what you want to do. But, you know, buying a, a stalwart like AG versus Majestic at 250 and exiting at 18 when silver only made whatever it was, a 40% move that year. When you have, a, you know, you know, hundreds of percent move in a, in a top tier New York NYSE stock like that as your trading vehicle, uh, and I consider it to be fairly safe. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very glad to do that and, do, and you know, let all the members see me do it and follow along. But, and that's not, you know, we just don't trade. I don't want to give the impression, oh, you're a trader. Well, yes, I am. Most of the people on the surface actually are just kind of buy and hold equity investors, <clears throat> but I do trade. And, 
in the premium service when I do it, which is not very often, uh, I let them know. So anyway, I digress. But uh, so now you've seen the screen, and uh, hopefully that was helpful. So yeah, if we could go back just for a moment to the uh, volume, uh, whether sure. you call it the coil or the pendant uh, to chart that shows the last two years. You were showing us from like December of uh, 2015 uh, to the current day of the silver prices and. Um, in in that it's it looks like what you're saying what mike maloney have been saying is that uh something's likely to break one way or the other there uh we're likely to see a fairly significant move one way or the other uh in in the next perhaps month or two uh in the metals markets and it sounds sure. like your other indicators um are a little bit uh, uh not showing us a clear picture of whether it's going to be going breaking to the upside or the downside, but that we're heading into a time when it looks like there's quite likely that we'll have a significant move. Right. And you could also make the argument, and I would actually make this argument, that you have what's called a bull flag, which is what I'm drawing now in red. So as you can see, the lows in silver, unlike gold, have been kind of there, 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 and there. So they've kind of bottomed pretty much at the same point all along. And that's a a bull flag, which is very bullish, which means it's far more likely to break to the upside than the downside. But however, if it broke to the downside, again, as I said, objectively, you let the market tell you what to do, which would be to go short the market. You also can see that the volume here is kind of fading off a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. drawing mm -hmm. out. For the last two months, last yeah. Couple months. That's kind of typical in the summer. But if you take a longer term perspective, on the uh, volume, you can see kind of this is from like 2014. And, you know, there's kind of like the average. But if you kind of draw, you're going to see that, which is, although it's kind of a slight slope, it is definitely increasing, which is absolutely true because I know what the open interests are. And as I said during the interview here, that it just continues to increase. And physical metals are not as robust as it used to be to repeat myself. So anything else that you'd like to address? Or? Those were the main Those points, and I'm really grateful for that, both the high-level uh, view and the zooming in on on the uh, economy and the equities markets and the precious metals markets and the real economy. And I uh, just appreciate it so much. Uh, David, we always like to ask you if you can make sure that our new viewers who are maybe hearing you for the first time know where to find your work. Sure. Yeah, the easiest thing to do is just get on. We have a paid service and a free letter. And the free letter, just go to themorganreport.com. And you can um, sign up here. I can do it now that I'm sharing the screen. So <clears throat> right here, you're going to hear me. I'll turn that off. Hopefully, I turned it off. So you just go to themorganreport.com. Oh, yeah, I know what you sound like. So you just give us a first name and your email, and you'll get this report, Riches and Resources, that I wrote. A lot of good stuff in there. It actually shows you if you want to, you can actually set up an internet precious metal dealership affiliate uh, program if you want. You know, make a few extra hundred a, a month if you choose to. Suggest that people come and look at the blog um, from time to time. You know, here's one I did. You know, I don't blog every single day. Most of them are videos uh, or audios like this. We'll post this on the blog, of course. Um, and then, of course, we always want, you know, the free list, as I just pointed out on the main page. And then, um, you know, if you want to, another thing to talk about is this about page. I know you guys don't care. You know, you probably know enough about me. But if you haven't seen this documentary, The Four Horsemen, yep. uh, I'm in it. And it's not about me being in it, although I was honored to be asked to be in it. But it's really a great documentary going right back to the beginning of our discussion. Yep. And it's about, you know, what is what's the big picture and what does it look like and what's really going on? And this documentary, even though it's been a few years now, talks about the age of empire and how the cycle of empires ebb and flow. And it's about it. All I have to do is go to my website or you Google it. And if you go to the about feature, you can just, you know, pop that up. <clears throat> Hour and 38 minutes, hour and 39 minutes. So I said an hour and 40 minutes long. But um, it's in several languages, like it says. 
got a lot of awards. A lot of real notables are in there. I would not consider myself in that range, but a lot of really well-known, respected uh, financial types <clears throat> are uh, are in this movie. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for letting me <laughs> go on a bit. Always fun to be with you. I like you know everyone that interviews me is very good as far as letting me kind of have a free reign. And that's what free markets and free speech are all about. You don't have to agree with everything I say, but there are nuggets in there, hopefully for everybody. I mean, I wish every time I do an interview is to just wake up one more person. Yep. You know, and that's very and that's, generous. That's, that's, yeah. I don't want people to necessarily do what I do or think what I think. I just want them to be aware. And I guess I'll close out with this, you know, Chris Dwayne and I have known each other for years. I, after re- wrote the silver shield and, um, uh, was silver, some silver short and silver shield, I think, but anyway, I call the Silver Shield now, and I called him and I complimented him on that essay that he written, which was several pages, and really distilled the silver market down, without leaving anything out in my view. And he um, continues to talk about what you can control. You know, quit focusing on you know what the bad guys are doing to us, and look at what you can do. And uh, I think that's really good to, to close out this interview because. You know, you are a free, sovereign being if you choose to think and act that way. That doesn't mean you go out and break any laws. All that means is that there are things within your own purview. You can choose what you eat. You can choose your friends. You can choose. And there's a lot of things you kind of box in. I get it. There's a lot of people going to work that hate it, and it's really hard to leave, and I get that. But uh, nonetheless, you know, you don't want to give up on yourself either. You know, it, the old adage, if there's a will, there's a way. So we've forgotten the power of being independent individuals. And then we've gotten all this group thing. You know, if everyone gets this color iPhone, I better get it. You know, I won't fit in, but I'm different. I'm unique. Put a different cover on that color iPhone and all this nonsense. I'm digressing. I'll leave it there. Thank you for having me. Oh, David, we're always glad to have you on. And thank you for giving us such a, a wide ranging tour of uh, perspectives tonight. As always, always great to have you here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you.